Good morning and welcome to the programme. Today, it's the exclusive story of the oldest case of double jeopardy in British history. I was watching a documentary on the TV. It was about this woman. She managed to get the murderer of her daughter rearrested. They called it double jeopardy. Well, my mouth just dropped. How a decades-old forensic sample proved that the man acquitted for a murder was a billion to one likely to have committed it. This is Crime Watch Live. Hello and thanks for joining us. We've got a busy programme today. Leicestershire Police are with us appealing for information on the murder of Father Raju Madwadia, who was stabbed on his way home from a party. What started as a gathering in a street in Leicester over the Christmas period in 2021 has ended with a devastating outcome for a family who've lost a much-loved member. Devon and Cornwall Police need to identify this woman after a vicious attack in a bar in Plymouth. And imagine waking up and finding your car like this. It's a relatively new crime trend called car cannibalism. We'll be talking to the West Midlands unit tasked with stopping it. If you can help with any of the appeals from the series, then please contact us. You can call for free on 08000 468 999 until midday. You can also text us anytime on 63399. Text the word crime, leave a space, then write your message. Text will be charged at your standard message rates, or you can just send us an email. The address is cwl at bbc.co.uk. First, on Boxing Day 2021, Raju Madwadia was fatally stabbed after attending a party in Leicester. The police need help finding out who was responsible. Raju was 41. He was part of a big family. He was one of six siblings. He came from India to start a new life in Leicester with his family and was close with his family. He enjoyed spending time with his eight-year-old son. Raju was really into his fitness. He used to play football with his son, and he was also into boxing. His son is inspired now to, to follow boxing like his dad. On Boxing Day in 2021, Raju Madwadia met some friends at a party on Hamilton Street in Leicester. It is a very low-key gathering of friends in the street. They are stood out having drinks, chatting, and just generally having, having a nice evening. <laughs> and then at 20 past 11, he attends the local shop where he purchases some whiskey to take back to the gathering. Raju appears to become more intoxicated as the evening goes on. The atmosphere within the group appears to change slightly. And his friends try and help him. They book a taxi for him. And he is heard to say, I'm going home now. But Raju never got into the taxi. Just seven minutes later, as his taxi drove by, he was seen on CCTV staggering across the road. He'd been stabbed five times. Ambulance service, is the patient breathing? No. No, tell me exactly what's happened. Uh, basically, we just passed from the, from the street. Uh, we're working out and we find someone in the floor. He's not breathing. Raji was taken to hospital, where he died from his injuries. What started as a gathering in a street in Leicester over the Christmas period in 2021 has ended with a devastating outcome for a family who've lost a much-loved member. Following the police's initial investigation, 
five men were charged with Raju's murder. But they were found not guilty. The camera doesn't cover where the incident occurred. It is a route where pedestrians have access to and from that street. There is potential that another party could have been involved that we are yet to uncover. So the incident where he receives his fatal stab wounds has occurred in this small area here. This area is heavily residential. We're at Christmas time, people will have been visiting family, friends, and there are lots of windows and doors that open up onto this street. We're appealing for witnesses to come forward because Raju's family deserve answers to what has occurred in the street that night. They've lost a loved one, a son, brother, and father. The family are devastated by the death of Raju and how he died, the fact that nobody has been brought to justice. And that's very difficult for them, and it's very difficult for his son to, to accept that as well. And he's struggling to come to terms with the loss of his father and the reasons why. Well, I'm joined now by DCI Nicole Main from Leicestershire Police. Uh, Nicole, thanks so much for coming in today. This is an incredibly sad case, isn't it? Um, firstly, what do we know about Raju? So Raju is a 41-year-old male, and he's known locally in the area as Kara Maru. Um, he's a much-loved family member. He comes from a large family, and he is the father of a young son. It's over a year since um, this incident occurred on Boxing Day in 2021, and understandably, the family is struggling to come to terms with his loss. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really tragic. So what have you managed to piece together from the night that this all happened? So we know that Raju attends Hamilton Street in Leicester on Boxing Day, um, and he attends there to a gathering with his friends. We know that shortly after midnight, he receives some stab wounds, fatal stab wounds, and he makes his way out onto Evington Road, where he collapses and he passes by, call an ambulance, he's taken to hospital where he sadly dies. There were various CCTV and doorbell cameras, which has helped you build up a timeline of events, hasn't it? But, but crucially, where the attack itself took place, that wasn't caught on CCTV, was it? No, the incident itself wasn't captured on CCTV, but we know Raju's movements before and after the incident itself. So we know what time he attends Hamilton Street, we know he's there at the gathering, and at 20 past 11, we know he goes to the local convenience store where he purchases some more alcohol and he returns to the party on Hamilton Street itself. Then we pick him up on a long view camera following the stabbing and he makes his way onto Evington Road and the collapse there is picked up on that camera. This has been impossible for the family to deal with, hasn't it? The son just can't understand why this has happened, how it happened. It's, it's just a real terrible thing for, for them to have to go through. In fact, they have given us an impact statement, haven't they, where they've said, Raju was a much loved son, brother and uncle, but most of all, a loving father to his young son. The day his son was born was the happiest and proudest moment of Raju's life. Raju was always there for his family and for his friends. How many more knife attacks can people tolerate and hear the news of another young person losing a life? This has to stop, and it starts with the people who know what happened to Raju. Really powerful words there from the family, Nicole. Um, now, there were some witnesses that you're really keen to speak to. Tell us about these people. Yes, yeah, so Hamilton Street is a dead-end street for vehicles, and shortly after midnight on the 27th of December 2021, we see a light-coloured vehicle, which we believe to be a light-coloured BMW 3 Series, drive up and down Hamilton Street, and the, the driver or passengers in that vehicle could have seen something that's crucial to our inquiries, and we urge them to make themselves known to us and ring in. Shortly after midnight, we have a witness who walks on the opposite side of the road at nine minutes past. Um, they may have passed the incident and can help us identify those involved. And then we see three males in the street at 19 minutes past looking towards where the incidents occurred. And they also could have been in the street at the time. So we would urge them to make themselves known and come forward to us. Unfortunately, we can't share the images of those people at this time to assist with that. 
Um, it's important to stress, isn't it, that these are witnesses, they're not suspects? Yes, absolutely. They are witnesses. They're seen in the street after the incident itself has occurred. And again, we appeal to them to come forward and help us with inquiries. It's a heavy residential area and we urge anybody who was there visiting relatives that night on the street, as it's Christmas time, it's Boxing Day, to come forward and, and assist us if they saw or heard anything. Yeah, and, and we do have to mention, don't we, Nicole, that there were five people who were previously charged in relation to the incident. We heard about that in the film there. They were found not guilty after the case was dismissed in court. Your focus very much remains on finding the people or person responsible for, for Raju's murder. Yes, it absolutely does. Myself and my team are committed to finding out those who are responsible for this crime that occurred in Leicester to provide answers for the family and prevent this happening again. And there is a, a Crime Stoppers reward in connection to this case, isn't there? Yes, there is. Um, there is a reward of £20,000 from Crime Stoppers for, um, and you can ring in anonymously for information that leads to an arrest and prosecution in this case. Um, it's vitally important that we capture all the witnesses in the street at that time. Like I've said, it was Christmas time, it was Boxing Day. People were out and about on that street. We've seen that from the CCTV. And it's crucial they come forward to assist us getting answers for a family and, and a young boy who's lost his dad. And as he grows up, he will understand what's happened to his father. And that's incredibly difficult to explain to somebody so young. Yeah, that's so true. It really is tragic and hopefully we'll be able to help get the answers uh, that you need. Nicole, thank you so much. So, were you on Hamilton Street around midnight on that Sunday night? Or were you one of the individuals who drove or walked past shortly after the incident? If so, then please get in touch. The number you need is 08000 468 Our lines are open until midday. And you can also text us anytime on 63399. You just need to text the word crime, leave a space and then write your message. Your text will be charged at your standard message rate. Or, of course, you could always send us an email. That address is cwl at bbc.co.uk. Later, we're in Coventry, seeing the inspiring work of one youth group aiming to give its local teens a chance to shine. We want young people to be young people and making sure that they can just have access to a fun session with positive role models in there and access to their peers in a safe space Now, imagine coming back to your car and finding it looking like this. It's known as car stripping or car cannibalism, and it's becoming a problem nationwide. West Midlands Police is one force working hard to put the brakes on these thieves. And I'm joined now by Detective Superintendent Jim Munro from the West Midlands Police Vehicle Task Force. Um, morning, Jim. I mean, they are pretty awful pictures. I mean, anyone would be devastated if they came back to see their vehicle like that. But is this something you're seeing a, a number of cases now? Absolutely. So we've had many victims who have parked their cars in car parks and also outside their homes and have woke up uh, and or come back to their vehicles and found them in this kind of condition. I mean, it'd be absolutely horrifying. Are you seeing this? Is this a quick thing that criminals have, have managed to do now? So what we're finding is criminals are able to remove these parts very quickly um, and they're very good. Yeah. if you like, at what they're doing. Um, and so this is making certain vehicle types in particular quite vulnerable. So have you identified a reason why certain criminals are, are taking the parts of vehicles as opposed to just trying to steal the, the entire car itself? So what we've seen is nationally there's been an issue with um, car parts supply, the war in Russia, Ukraine, um, and the difficulties in parts getting across. A lot of parts are manufactured there, but also the delay from the pandemic, um, where a lot of vehicles aren't coming through on order as, as quick as customers would like. So in the West Midlands, we started to see a rise in this offending. So we set up a dedicated task force in September last year, and their role is to, to get out. We know that these crimes are affecting victims in our neighbourhoods arrest vehicle crime offenders uh, and we've been focusing uh, a lot on so-called chop shops which is where stolen vehicles are often taken uh, and stripped of parts and what we are finding now is um, having closed down some of these chop shops and focused really hard on that offending criminals have now started to move to dismantling vehicles in situ uh, particularly right. around parts bumpers and wing mirrors, which we know are common parts that people often... So are they the parts that are most likely to be stolen then? Those bits that can be sort of more easily removed? Is yeah, that what, it what is? we're seeing is more front end, so bonnet, um, wings, wing mirrors, um, type of stuff that you see in more common accident damage uh, and obviously those parts retail um, back out and, and obviously fuel the, the criminal market. Are there any particular types of car 
that are more likely to be targeted than others. So just by the very nature, we've seen the West Midlands, that the Ford Fiesta uh, has been targeted um, quite heavily, that there's a lot of those vehicles in circulation. Mm. So, so by that, um, by those very numbers yeah. that are out there, um, we've, we've seen certainly that in the West Midlands. Now, I know you've actually been working with some car manufacturers themselves to try and, and help combat this problem. How's that going? Well. Obviously, this is um, you know, an approach that we need to engage with the industry for. Um, we are coming across and seizing a lot of equipment that's used to, to get into the vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we need to work with those manufacturers so they can work with their security teams to make sure that they're upgrading their security systems to help try and prevent uh, this type of offending. So certainly some positive steps, but is there anything that we can do ourselves to try and keep our cars that bit safer? So check always that your fob has done its job. Okay. Um, don't just walk away from your vehicle thinking that it's been locked. What we are seeing is uh, criminals are actively in the area, targeting locations, retail parks, where they're using um, devices that jam the signal uh, so that you think your vehicle is actually locked, but it's not. So if I've left my vehicle in a, in a supermarket car park, for example, and I'm walking into the shops and I press the button and I just assume it has locked my car, you're saying that's not enough just to think like that because they might have actually jammed that signal getting to the car and it's still unlocked. Absolutely. So and I should check my fob has done its job. job. So, yeah. Absolutely, because that is um, what we've seen in a, a numerous occasion, no. occasions and um, criminals are straight into the vehicle um, and they plug in devices and they steal the vehicle within a matter of minutes. So something that would take me literally a second to check that the mirrors have gone in, the lights have flashed, whatever it is, listen to the sound of that locking mechanism, that could really save my vehicle. So that's really, really important. We've got a device here, Jim. Um, what's this and why could this be so important? So. Um, with what we have seen is steering locks such as this that cover the whole steering wheel um, deter uh, this type of offending. We know that from dealing with criminals in custody, uh, from debriefing them. So what we advise people is, is to get a good quality steering lock. A car is probably the second most expensive yeah. thing people may buy. So secure your vehicle. Get a lock like this. Uh, and what we're seeing is often criminals will cut round steering locks to, to get them off if they're just a conventional bar type. So one that covers the whole steering wheel uh, is like, will make you less of a victim. So it's not necessarily the cheapest option, but it really could protect your vehicle much more than something uh, less substantial than Absolutely. this. Absolutely. OK, anything about where you actually park the vehicle? So when you're parking, particularly we've, we've seen car parks targeted, but they're generally they're poorly lit. So Think about where you're leaving your car. Are, are you comfortable in that location? Is it well lit? Is there good CCTV? Um, do you know the location? Or, you know, mm -hmm. be careful where you're parking your car. I come back to that these cars are expensive items and protect your property. Now, I know you're passionate about this. You and your team have been doing a lot of work. Um, we're going to see some footage here of actually your team in action. Just talk us through what's happening here, Jim. So, uh, this is the task force. Um, I, uh, conducting a warrant uh, under the Theft Act. And what we've seen here is an individual who has been stripping vehicles and selling the parts. We believe he was responsible for numerous offences mm -hmm. across the Birmingham area, targeting car parks and uh, other areas where vehicles have been parked. Uh, and he has now been charged with a conspiracy to steal from vehicles and he's been put before the courts. Really, really good result there, Jim. And I know just quickly, you just want to make a plea to the public. If you do see something happening right now, as someone's perhaps taking some parts off cars, don't just ignore it. Don't expect someone else to make the call. You want them to do that. Crime in action, 999, or if anyone's got any information, 101. Great advice as ever, Jim. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. Michelle. Now, 20 years ago, a change in the law meant that in limited cases, someone found not guilty of a crime could be put on trial again if substantial new evidence emerged. Our next story is a landmark example of this law in action. She was very generous, very sweet, fun-loving. She was intellectual. She liked to write poetry. Jackie and I were very close as sisters. There was only 13 months between us, but there wasn't anything we didn't tell each other. Jackie and Cathy Montgomery grew up together in London in the 1970s. When their parents split up, 15-year-old Jackie went to live with their dad. But the sisters remained close until one week in the summer of 1975. I met up with uh, Jackie in the daytime and we went to the park. We sat there for about an hour, hour and a half, chatting away and laughing. But that evening, they would say goodbye for the final time. On the evening of Saturday, 31st of May, Jackie's dad went out. Jackie, I'm off, love. 
leaving her at home alone. When he returned, he made a horrifying discovery. She had been stabbed five times to the front, and she had been stabbed once to the back. There was evidence that a struggle had taken place. The phone was off the hook. There was a chair that was overturned. She looked as though she'd been sexually assaulted. She also had the cord flex of an electric iron wrapped around her neck, and there were certainly signs that Jackie had fought for her life. It destroyed my life. I didn't know how to grieve. None of us did. It destroyed my dad, completely and utterly destroyed my dad. And I'd see him crying, and that, sort, that man never cries about nothing. A very hard man, my dad was, but it broke him. Police quickly identified a prime suspect. In the months before her murder, Jackie had spent time with her aunt, who had an abusive partner. His name was Dennis McGrory. We knew straight away it was him. We knew before he was even arrested it was him. He was violent to my auntie, always drunk. It is believed that on the weekend of Jackie's death, he found out that his ex-partner was in a relationship with somebody else which may have fueled his rage. It was believed, certainly by police at the time, that he was at the address trying to find his ex-partner. Where are you? I know you're here! Police suspected that, when he discovered she wasn't there, he turned on Jackie. When he was detained, he had visible signs of injuries to his face, to his arms, to his hands. In 1976, long before DNA evidence was available, McGrory stood trial for Jackie's murder. But he was acquitted. He was laughing in the dock. He was big like a Cheshire cat smiling. No one could believe it. It was so upsetting. For him to get off of it, as well as losing her, it was just a double whammy. I just wanted justice for my sister. That's all I've ever wanted. For nearly 40 years, the case went cold. Until, in 2015, a television programme gave Cathy fresh hope. I was watching a documentary on the, on the TV, sitting in bed, and uh, it was about this woman, and uh, she managed to uh, get the, uh, the murderer of her daughter re-arrested and, uh, and they called it double jeopardy. Well, my mouth just dropped. In 2005, a change to the law had come into force, allowing a suspect to be tried again for the same crime if there was new and compelling evidence. The first thing in the morning, I rang up Islington Police Station and I said I'd like to report a cold case murder. The police agreed to review the evidence from the original investigation. There's only one opportunity to reopen a case under double jeopardy legislation, and the bar is set very high. A check was done with our registry to see whether or not we still had any files relating to the murder of Jackie. We had a box of original statements that were made by witnesses at the time, and we subsequently found that we also had a forensic file. And within the forensic files, there were still swabs. We were hopeful that the material that was found, the swabs that were found on the file, would contain DNA evidence. 43 years after Jackie's murder, police were able to obtain a full DNA profile of her killer. Police already had DNA from Dennis McGrory, taken in 2009 when he was convicted of domestic violence. And when they compared the two samples, they matched. It was actually 
quite emotional receiving that phone call. It was monumental. The evidence that we now had suggested very strongly that Dennis McGorry had not only murdered Jackie, he had also raped her. By now in his early 70s, Dennis McGrory was re-arrested. And on the 2nd of February 2021, 46 years after Jackie's murder, the Court of Appeal quashed his acquittal. When we actually got him arrested, I can't even put into words how I felt. The relief of my uh, heart, it just melted. Dennis McGrory was found guilty of the rape and murder of Jackie Montgomery. He was sentenced to life and ordered to serve a minimum of 25 years. You have shown not one iota of remorse or compassion for Jackie or Jackie's family. I can only hope that your conviction and the sentence I pass will provide them with some closure, safe in the knowledge that you have been brought to justice and will hereafter live out your days in prison. It was a very emotional day to convict somebody who had conducted the most horrific attack on a 15-year-old girl. It's a key message to people who think they've got away with something that happened a long time ago. We will still keep trying. We will still look at cases that are historic and we do have the means to be able to solve them. It's been a long time coming, a very long time coming. And now I know justice is done and he's sitting in prison. I feel great. He doesn't bring her back. But justice has been done. Just incredible tenacity of Jackie's sister there to keep fighting for her. Now, a brazen assault in a bar has left a 27-year-old woman with potentially permanent damage to her face. Here to tell us more is PC Ange Comber from Devon and Cornwall Police. Um, thank you for coming in today, Ange. What can you tell us about this incident? Oh, good morning. Um, this incident happened last year on the 1st of October 2022. The victim, the female victim, travelled to Plymouth to spend some time with a friend. Um, they've gone to the... Mambo Club, which is on the Barbican in Plymouth, and it's um, around about 2,300 hours at the bar area is where she sustained an unprovoked attack by an unknown female. OK, and we obviously need to, to trace who that is. So Absolutely. you've provided us with some CCTV here. Let's have a look at this and talk us through what we're seeing. So initially we've got a male here in a polo shirt talking to the female victim. Um, there is a, another female that, that uh, comes up to the bar. Here we are. We can see that She's there. a suspect there. Um, several punches have been thrown and they both... Oh, I mean, it almost it appears to come from, from nowhere. Yeah, she just comes absolutely. in and next minute the, the, the punches are thrown. Seems very little motive there. So what have you been able to establish about the suspect? We've exhausted all our inquiries um, and we're, we're hoping for some help really to identify both the female suspect and potentially the male in the footage as a witness to speak to. And hopefully someone at home can help us with that today. So let's have a look at who she is. We can see her here. This is from the CCTV of that day. It's a very good image. It's a clear image. Just talk us through the description of the person you want to identify as your suspect. Sure. She's a, she's a white female. Um, she's in her mid to late 20s, shoulder length, brown, dark, wavy hair. At the time of the incident, she was wearing uh, ripped blue denim jeans, a black crop top um, and white trainers with a black trim. She's actually carrying a large uh, black leather handbag there. And that's what you can see in the, the picture. OK, now there's also the male that she was with. You'd like to speak to him as well. Now, he is a potential witness, of course, yes. and being treated as such, but you would like to identify this man as well. Can you just give us uh, the description of this person? So, again, a white male, I believe mid to late 20s. Um, he's wearing a Fred Perry light blue polo shirt, and you can see there's a dark blue trim on the sleeves and, and collar, um, and black jeans. And the victim herself was left with some pretty nasty injuries, wasn't she? She was indeed, yes. Um, she sustained two black eyes. Um, she now is having some visual issues with her right eye 
and she's been left with some permanent scarring on her lip as well. OK, so they're, they're the scars you can see, but of Absolutely. course there's some other things that have happened as well. Yeah, th that's the physical um, impact. Obviously, you've got the mental and emotional impact of, of going through something like this. Um, she was left very shaken up. She's a very young girl um, and she's in fear for going out, you know, of an evening and, and that shouldn't be. No, you're absolutely right. So how can the public help you today? We'd like to identify both the female suspect and the male as a witness, please. Um, any information, if you were there on the evening, you know, please do get in touch uh, and just sort of provide us with anything that you can. Yeah, so we need names for both the suspect and the witness we can see in the screen here. And of course, if you were in the bar at the time and you saw this, you may not, might not realise how bad it was. You need to hear from those potential witnesses Absolutely. as well. OK, Absolutely. Ange, thank, thank you. you. If you have any f information, please do get in touch. The contact details are on your screen. We're off to Coventry now to see how one charity is raising the expectations of their city's youth. My name's Christian Singh and I am the Director of Operations for Positive Youth Foundation. We want young people to be young people and making sure that they can just have access to a fun session with positive role models in there and access to their peers in a safe space in the community that everyone can feel part of and feel proud of. The Winter Youth Club provides every young person that attends with a hot meal, access to make sure that they've got a drink and they can even take a hot meal home to their family if they need to or give it to a vulnerable member of their community. This is the Hillfields area of Coventry. Notoriously known for high rates of youth violence, youth crime, drug and alcohol addiction. The life expectancy in this area is 10 years shorter than an area 10 minutes up the road. It's an area that I've grew up in. I did get myself into trouble as a youngster. I was excluded from schools. I was in trouble with the police. There was a lot more opportunities for me to involve myself in negative behaviour rather than positive ones. But being able to access a youth group, being able to access professionals that showed that they cared about me and were able to open opportunities and doors for me allowed me to excel as a young person and allowed me to use some of those leadership skills that I naturally had for something positive. My name is Ahmed Mohammed. I'm a senior youth engagement officer at Positive Youth Foundation. We tend to find that a lot of young people don't see their full potential. They tend to say like, I'm going to work in a warehouse, then I'm going to make some money, then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. No one knows about the other options. So we support young people to create that bigger picture. It's like a map. We support young people to find their destination. They show us like, a lot of things, how to get better, and they help us a lot with education, mental health. They treat you like a family, so like if you have any problems, they will actually find you get a job, they'll find you pretty much kind of all things you actually need. I've been coming since I was like 11 years old or something, and it's always there for us, just, you know, just show us love, you know. I'd like to see my community up there, rather than seeing people within my community fail. What do you like most about coming here? Um, you get to meet new people, you have fun here, and it's a great place to hang out. I've never come across a person that I thought was born bad. You know what I mean? If you look at their environment, you look at the challenges that, that they face and you can understand some of the choices that they make and, and why they're involving themselves in certain types of behaviour. And I do think that a lot of the young people, given the right opportunity, they're excelled. And we're making sure that as many young people from this area can showcase their talents and their expertise and have the skills and the tools that they can go on and have successful futures. And every day I'm rewarded in my job through seeing young people progress and shine. Fantastic work by Christian and the team there. Now, many fires in the home can start accidentally and the effects can be devastating. Fire detection systems, including heat alarms, smoke alarms or carbon monoxide alarms, give us that extra time to escape and can save countless lives. Well, I'm joined now by Fire Investigation Officer Dave Koss from Nottinghamshire Fire and Rescue Service, who carried out some really interesting research 
on fire alarms. And you had quite a personal connection to this research, didn't you, Dave? Tell us a bit more. Yes, unfortunately, back in 2012, um, we had a uh, fatal house fire in Derby in which six children died, um, tragically. Part of the investigation, we couldn't quite work out why the children hadn't escaped. Mm. And they were all rescued from their beds. So we started to look at whether a smoke alarm would actually wake the children in the first place, and we found out that it didn't. Well, this is what's so interesting, isn't it? Through conducting this research, you, you unearthed some really interesting findings. Tell us more. So we, we looked at different age groups, different genders, male and female, and we discovered primarily that boys between 0 to 9 um, is virtually impossible to wake them up with a smoke alarm at Just... any time whilst they're asleep. It's absolutely terrifying, isn't it? What else did you discover? Uh, it is, but obviously um, we, we're happy that uh, adults will wake up to a smoke alarm. That's mm. not a problem. So it's not the big panic that everybody thinks it is. It just means that we have to change our advice to, to match the research that we've found. That's what's key, isn't it? This research has helped you look into a, a different way of approaching how we escape from a fire. So we always encourage every family to have an escape plan, um, how to get out of the house, keys by the door, phone by the, the uh, bed, things like that. But in past, our advice has always been, children, when you hear the smoke alarm, go into mummy and daddy's bedroom. Mm. All we're saying now is that adults, when you hear the smoke alarm, make sure your children have got up and are responding to the alarm. Yeah, that's really important advice to, to know. And you've got examples of, of different smoke alarms with you today. There's quite a variety, isn't there, Dave? Just just talk us through what we've got from your end to my end. So um, from, from my end first, we've got what we call a standard smoke detector, which should be fitted um, at least one on every level uh, in every property. And then we've got a uh, heat detector there, which is usually fitted in places like kitchens where steam and burnt toast, things like that, would, would set off a normal one. Uh, carbon monoxide one particularly now that a lot of people are resorting back to log burners. Um, every room where you've got some sort of fossil burning fire, either a gas boiler or a log burner, you should have a, a carbon monoxide detector in there. And then finally, on the end, we've got the deaf alarms, or for the people that are hard of hearing, um, they might not be able to hear the alarm sounding. So we have a pressure pad that sits underneath the pillow, and we've also got flashing lights there that will actually alert them if, if the alarm's sounding. And, Dave, if people aren't entirely sure what alarm they should be using and, and where, what advice would you give them? Where, where should they go to look for information? So, throughout the UK for several years now, all fire services have been carrying out what we call safe and well visits or, or home fire safety checks. Um, anybody with any issues whatsoever, if you contact your local fire service, they will gladly come out and they'll even support you with potentially fitting smoke detectors for you if, if they're required. For viewers that are watching this morning, especially parents with young children, what is the key message that you want to get across to, to stick with them? So the key thing for us is have an escape plan uh, and more importantly, have a pre-tested escape plan. So um, work out what's going to happen if the alarms sound, where are you going to meet up, how are you going to get out of the, the house, where's the keys for the front door, how do we get down the stairs um, and more importantly, pre-test it involve the children, let the children understand what's going to happen, mm -hmm. even to the point where on a Sunday afternoon you could actually have the children pretending to be asleep, you could pretend to set the alarm off and actually walk through your plan. Because the, the, thing, first time, the first time you, you use that plan doesn't want to be in anger. Yeah, that, that's so true, isn't it? Because often we can just think in our own heads what our escape plan might be, but having those open, you know, honest conversations with your family, communicating with them and actually role-playing it, going through it in real time is important. Something as simple as two minutes on a role-play on a Sunday afternoon could save your life if you needed it in reality. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Dave, for coming in, talk us, talking us through the alarms and, and giving us that advice, because, as you said, it's, it's, it's vital. It's something that we should all remember. Thank you so much for coming in today. Rav. Now, let's take a look at today's Wanted Faces. And first, we have Stephen Shannon. Officers in Merseyside want to speak with him about some firearm-related offences. He's 28 years old, of a slim build, with dark, curly brown hair and brown eyes. Or maybe you recognise James Campbell, although he also uses the names Paul and John and the surname Withers. He was jailed in 2014 for kidnap and possession of an offensive weapon. He was released in 2022. Since then, he's breached the conditions of his licence and has been recalled to prison. He's 51, of a heavy build, and has a shaved head with a two-inch scar on his scalp. He has a noticeable lazy right eye and a number of tattoos, including a tiger on the right side of his chest and a swallow on the left side. Right. 
He's known to travel to quiet rural and coastal areas and has connections to Milford Haven and Haverford West in West Wales and also Newcastle as well as Bournemouth, Birmingham, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Police do advise that if you see him, don't approach. Next today, have you seen August Jeuzu? Officers in South Yorkshire believe he may have vital information about a murder. The 39-year-old has a receding hairline and wears a close shaved beard. He's originally from Albania but also speaks Italian. He has connections across England including the whole of Yorkshire, Bedfordshire, Leicestershire and Essex. And finally for today, do you recognise John Belfield? Greater Manchester Police want to talk to him about a murder. The 28-year-old is described as having a muscular build, light brown hair, blue eyes and he sometimes has a beard. He has a Northern English accent and has contacts in Greater Manchester, Lancashire as well as to Spain and Tenerife. Again, if you see him, police advise don't approach, instead call 999. You can call about any of the wanted faces on the number on your screen. Just time now for a quick update on this morning's appeals. So earlier we heard about that assault in Plymouth, which left its victim with potentially permanent damage to her sight. The images of the people police want to talk to in connection with that are on our website and iPlayer, so please do take another look. And we also heard about the murder of Raju Madwadia, who was tragically killed in the street after a Boxing Day party in Leicester. And back with DCI Nicole Main. Um, this was a, a, a terrible attack, sadly led to the, the death of Raju, who we can see there. Now, there are some witnesses that you really want to identify, aren't there? Yes, there are. We urge the... There is a BMW that drives past around the time that the fatal stabbing occurs. It drives along Hamilton Street, turns round and back towards Evington Road, where it turns right. That's believed to be a light-coloured BMW 3 Series, and the passengers and driver, we urge them to come forward. They may have seen something crucial to our inquiries. We also see a witness, a potential witness, who walks on the other side of the road at nine minutes past midnight, and again, that person could have seen the attack occur. There is also a group of three males on the street at 19 minutes past. They're in the middle of the street and they're looking down towards where the incident occurred. And again, they could have seen something vital. It's Boxing Day and there is, it is a heavy residential area. Um, there are plenty of people who could have been visiting family and friends and we urge them, if you saw or heard anything, to come forward and help us to find answers for a family. Um, there is a, a Crime Stoppers reward of £20,000 in, in connection to this case as well, isn't there? There is, and that um, is in place if we get information that leads to arrest and prosecution for people responsible for the death of Raju. Um, it's vital people come forward and give us the information to provide answers for a much-loved family member to the family and to prevent these kind of incidents happening again. Yeah, as we said before, this has had a huge, devastating impact on Raju's family. They are really looking for answers. They want justice to be served. So, Nicole, thank you very much for coming in and reminding us about this case. If you do have any information, the details are on your screen now. Thanks for joining us today. We're back tomorrow at 10am with Britain's fastest cop. He's so speedy that he's never failed to catch a fleeing suspect. I've probably had about 80 foot chases or so over the last six years. People often try to run and um, they just haven't gotten away yet. Oh. Make you under arrest. Very impressive. Uh, and remember, if you're affected by any of the issues in today's show, you can find details of organisations which offer advice and support at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. And for more details about the crimes featured on today's programme and to watch some of the series so far, then you can head to BBC iPlayer, where we'll be available for the next seven days. We're going to leave you with this morning's Wanted Faces now. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good morning and welcome to Thursday's show. Coming to you live from our studios in Cardiff. 
Today, we're hearing the story behind these jaw-dropping images. A reckless driver tries to outwit the police by driving a car on a set of train tracks and how he was eventually caught. This is Crime Watch Live. Hello and thanks for joining us on our penultimate programme for the series. Coming up today, 21-year-old Takeo Nembard was celebrating with family and friends at the Notting Hill Carnival when he was fatally stabbed. The Met Police want to speak to this man who may hold vital information about the case. Can you also help find the man who left a father of two with life-changing injuries after he accidentally brushed the shoulders of a complete stranger? Just a pure accident, bump of the shoulders. And that's that's what sort of sparked his anger. One punch um, that's done, done all the damage. And we'll be joined by the RSPB, who want us to be vigilant after a spate of attacks on birds of prey. If you can help with any of the appeals from the series, then please contact us. You can call for free on 08000 468 999 until midday. You can also text us anytime on 63399. Text the word crime, leave a space, then write your message. Text will be charged at your standard message rates. Or send us an email. The address is cwl at bbc.co.uk. And those details are on the screen next to the clock throughout the show. First this morning, it's the murder of a young father-to-be, Takeo Nembard, who was stabbed and killed at London's Notting Hill Carnival. Earlier, I spoke to Takeo's parents, Sandra and Vincent, and asked them what Takeo was like as a person. Um, charismatic, funny, headstrong, um, thoughtful. Um... Oh, I think I... Kieran. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. caring. And really into his education, I hear as well. Yep. Yeah, he was bright. He was bright from a very early age. Very early age. Like um, when he was like 18 months, he could count to 10 in twos. We realised in nursery. So yeah, very bright from a very early age. Didn't need to study. He could just pick things up quite easily throughout school. So he came off with good education. And he was a musician and a rapper as well, wasn't he? And his parents, you really supported his, his passion for music. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. We tried to support him with anything he wanted to do, to be fair. We couldn't steer him to do with what he didn't want to do. He'd always have his own ideas mm. as to what he wanted to do. And he wanted to release his own music, is that right? Well, he, he did, yeah. But before that, he used to be a footballer before. He, um, from the age of six, he was um, in Bristol Rovers Academy till under 16, then he moved to Cheltenham. And so, and then he had a bad injury at Cheltenham. So that kind of stopped his career. So that was his first passion, football. Mm -hmm. And then when he couldn't play it anymore, then he, he'd move over to music while he was doing an, an apprenticeship in plumbing with um, Bristol City Council as well. So, yeah, so the, then the music take over. Clearly an extremely talented boy and, as we said, he wanted to release his music and, and you're actually planning to release the music that he created in his memory? Yes, well, I did. I did. I released, uh, I released an EP um, last week. Yeah, so, no, yeah, so that's what he wanted to do. Um, before then, we was just releasing, just releasing singles, but then this year we were planning to release in, like, EP or album. So I said... Um, I have to just try and carry on some of his legacy. Of course. Yeah. In his honour. Yeah. I have to ask you both, how are you doing? How are you coping? Because it's it's such a tragic thing that's happened. Day by day, really. Every day is a battle. Every day is a battle. And I'm always just one blink away from crying. I just, some days I manage to be stronger and some days I can't hold it together, so it's just every day we just deal with it as best we can, to be fair. Yeah. And we have we have his sisters that we have to keep pushing on for as well, so I think if they weren't about, it would be a very different story, but I have to be strong for them. 
Sandra, for, for people that are watching this morning who may hold some information ab about what happened, what would you say to them? <sighs> Please end our pain. It's so painful having to do interviews and things like that and appeals to get justice we just please try and end our pain i know i know people are scared of the, the involvement and things like that but um if they could just i know it's not going to bring him back but it would at least end our pain somewhat because it is really hard trying to hold it together all the time so yeah i would just say please be brave and the police will protect you as much as you can yeah, that's what I have to say. Sandra Vincent, thank you so much for coming in today. I know it hasn't been easy, and I really hope that we can find some answers. Thank you. Okay. And I'm now with Detective Inspector Laura Semple from the Met Police, who is leading this murder investigation. Um, hello, Laura. Clearly a very emotional appeal for a very much loved young man. What, what can you tell us about this incident? So Takea Nembard uh, travelled from Bristol to Notting Hill Carnival. Um, it, um, Notting Hill Carnival is an extremely busy event. Hundreds of thousands of people travel to Notting Hill. It's loud. Um, obviously, the crowds are huge. So he travelled with some family and friends to the carnival. And then on Monday, the 29th of August, around 8pm, um, he'd walked from along Chesterton Road um, down Labrick Grove. Um, towards this is the area we can see on the map here now. Yeah, that's correct. Towards sort of Westway, which was where sadly he was fatally stabbed. So he received one stab wound um, to sort of the right groin area, um, which uh, sadly hit his femoral artery um, and he shortly collapsed um, and later died. Yeah, it, it's an awful, awful incident. I know there was lots of emergency services there who responded, who tried to treat him at the scene, but it was shortly after that he lost his life. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a heavily policed event. Um, the police saw him collapse and that was where they treated him um, and later was treated by an ambulance service as well, but sadly it couldn't be saved. It is, as you say, heavily policed. There's lots of CCTV around the area. Has that assisted your investigation so far? So it enabled us to sort of track Takeo's movements during the evening um, and what it also enabled us to do was see a group running away from the scene um, so we've arrested five people and they've all been released under investigation. Um, but what we are still trying to do is identify one further individual. So we'd really like the public's help today um, with tracing that individual. He's quite distinctive. Um, so we can see an image here and we're going to show another image. This is the same person. Um, and as you say, quite distinctive because of what he's wearing, the, uh, the, the headgear there. We just saw the hat that he was wearing on that, that individual there. We can see this image here. This is quite distinctive, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so we believe that it says Yankees. Uh, he's a black male um, with a sort of baseball cap on. So any help that anyone can give us to identify him would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, because this person may hold some vital information that could help the investigation. At this stage, have you had any witnesses come forward? Because as you've mentioned, this is very busy. There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people in the area. Has anyone come forward and said they've seen what happened? So we haven't as yet. And um, as I said, it'd be really, really useful. Anyone that's seen anything, people travel from all around the, the country. So anyone that's seen anything, Takeo is quite distinctive. Um, he's, very, he's very tall, he's six foot eight. Um, so, yeah, any help that we can get. And, and if people Takeo are scared, here. then... As you say, very, very tall. He, he may have stood out at the time. People may have noticed him. And we need to know what happened to him then. Yeah, and if people are scared, please just come forward and we can put safety measures in place to try yeah. and protect you. It all starts with a conversation, doesn't it? You just need people to pick up the phone, speak to you and your team. You will do whatever you can to keep them as safe as possible. You just need that information. Yes, Laura. please. Thank you. Thank you. So, were you at Notting Hill Carnival on that Monday evening? It was around 8pm, remember? It was the 29th of August of last year. And did you see anything? Remember, Takeo was, as we've just said, very, very tall. Maybe he stood out to you. Or do you recognise this 
individual. If you have any information at all, the number to call is 08000 468 999. Our lines are open. They're going to be open until midday. You can also text us anytime, and that number is 63399. Text the word crime, leave a space, and then write your message. Texts are going to be charged at your standard message rate, or just send us an email. The address is cwl at bbc.co.uk. Still to come today, we'll be hearing from the European Jiu-Jitsu champion whose love for martial arts helped her confront her abusive childhood. You have to use the right techniques in order to overcome a bigger opponent. And I truly suggest every girl and every woman to give it a go. But first, I'm joined by a familiar face. You may remember PC Jill Brettles from our last series. She was caught up in a dramatic and aggressive foot chase with a suspect on the side of the M11. You stay here, stand still. At the moment, I'm arresting you on suspicion of theft of a motor vehicle, section four. Get down on the floor! And she mentioned another crazy case that she'd been involved in, so we had to follow up. On the 15th of July 2021, PC Jill Brettel and her partner were on a routine patrol in Essex. I was on an early turn, so we started at six o'clock in the morning, and this call came in to me around nine o'clock. A vehicle tracking company had pinpointed the location of a black Land Rover Discovery reported as stolen. And we received further information to tell us that the vehicle was shown as stationary. The officers assumed the car had been abandoned. Everything was good until I drove up next to it. And the moment I looked left and saw someone in it, I knew the situation had changed. PC Brettel needed to arrest the suspect. So she tried to block the Land Rover in whilst her partner approached the driver. I looked around and I could see a fist coming out of the driver's window. It was clear that this uh, man that was in the car wasn't going to be coming out without our help. My colleague was reaching through the window to open the door, which was locked. He managed to get the door open, but was violently closed. It nearly caught my arm in it. Watch out. Tango 27. This man was trying to start the car, so we were doing everything we could to pull him out. It was there I saw that he had his seatbelt on. So I reached inside, pressed the seatbelt to release the seatbelt from him. Get out to the car! Out to the car! Out to the car! But suddenly, the driver started the car, reversing at speed, Help, Dan. taking her partner with him. I've just seen my colleague being dragged off. I thought that that was the end for my colleague. It was horrible. My partner was extremely lucky. He got bruising and scrapes from being thrown from the vehicle. Sam, you are right. We had lots of distressed members of the public. There was a number of vehicles that had been damaged. You are right, Dan? I was making sure my colleague was OK, and then just actually trying to calm down. Are you OK? Because I felt upset with what I just witnessed. You OK? <laughs> The adrenaline's running, isn't it? Tango 27, we need assistance, please. Can you get parts? It's fight or flight. Fine. Man, he's okay. going. Yeah. He wanted to get away, and that was all he wanted to do. We have to stop him doing that, and we tried everything we could to stop him doing that, but unfortunately, he was able to get away. But PC Brettel hadn't given up hope of catching the driver and began trying to establish where he might be heading. If you go straight down that way, where does it go? Just it goes straight into the into Lee Valley. Lee Valley? Yeah, it doesn't Is it like a dead end? Yeah, you can't yeah, get out of the car. End, yeah. In his haste to get away, the driver had sped across a level crossing and towards a canal. With nowhere to turn, he took the extraordinary decision to abandon the stolen car and try to swim across. Realising that was a bad idea, he's witnessed returning to the car, his clothes dripping wet. Then he's filmed by dismayed onlookers doing a three-point turn in a field before tearing off back towards the level crossing and PC Brettel. 
as I was looking down the road, I saw a vehicle coming back towards where I was. But at this point, the train barriers were down. With nowhere left to go, the driver smashes through the level crossing barriers and takes a left. On to the railway tracks. 2-7, this car is on the track, on the track. Guys, move away, please, move! Guys, move back in case he comes back. Stunned commuters watched in horror as the car drove through a station and along the main line for more than half a mile. Police decided it was simply too dangerous to pursue him any further. The London to Stansted Express line runs straight through there. That doesn't stop and travels at high speed. He must know that there's an imminent train coming because that's the only reason the barriers go down. Really dangerous. Determined to catch this reckless driver, DC Jim Simpson headed up an investigation. We've managed to recover his footwear and found the DNA to our offender within the shoes. Within the vehicle itself, we've sent a scene to crime officer. They've done a search of the car. They've found a phone within the car. Within 24 hours, that work yielded a name, Kieran Pepper. We've searched on the social media of Kieran Pepper and we found the guy we're looking for. We can identify him from the body-worn footage of the struggle taking place in the car. We've seen a tattoo on the hand and a good facial image. It's guaranteed we've got the right person. Days after the incident, officers arrested Kieran Pepper, also known as Kieran Francis. And it was the brazen public nature of his crimes that ultimately led to his downfall. Members of the public with their phones have gathered the best evidence. They've uploaded it on the social media, on an open platform where we can, we can drag it off and use it as evidence and show the court the full extent of the criminality of the driving. Kieran Francis was found guilty of multiple offences, including the obstruction of a railway line with intent to endanger a person. He was found not guilty of stealing the car. He is currently awaiting sentencing. This incident could have been terrible. It could have been catastrophic. What he's done is just beyond me. To drive down a busy railway station, trains imminently arriving, could have lost a lot of lives. He didn't care who got hurt that day. Police officers, members of the public, just didn't care. As well as putting people's lives in danger, his reckless driving caused misery for thousands of rail commuters, causing 66 train cancellations and more than eight hours of delays. Never a dull day. Yeah. Just couldn't get him out, could we? I just stood with my colleague on the platform uh, in complete shock, to be honest, of what had just happened. Such a dangerous, reckless act. He clearly had no regard for the police. He had no regard for any of the people around him. His sole intention was to escape custody. Jill, what can I say? I mean, that footage is absolutely shocking, especially seeing the vehicle on the train tracks. I mean, this is just another extraordinary case <laughs> that, that you've been involved in. And actually, before Kieran Pepper was finally caught, he had a lovely afternoon, didn't he? Tell us what happened. Well, yes, yeah, so he made refuge on a local canal boat uh, where they took pity on him because he was cold and wet. So they then bought him uh, McDonald's, gave him some dry clothes. I think he remained there for about nine hours. Um, until they let he use his phone and his brother come picked him up. I mean, this case just gets more shocking. Somehow it just doesn't surprise me that he would willingly take advantage of, you know, some, some nice people that are just trying to help. For everything that you and your colleague Dan went through that day, I bet you were so relieved to hear that your colleagues in Hertfordshire actually managed to locate and, and arrest him. Absolutely. Obviously, he's identifiable on the body wall video um, and they got hold of him very quickly. So I was, yes, very happy. Now, as we said earlier, we've spoken to you before about another case where you were in pursuit of a, a vehicle, uh, of a criminal rather. Um, but since then, you've actually um, received a lovely award. Is that the Wilson yes. Trophy? What was there that is. for? 
Uh, so that was for bravery. So I got a chief um, accommodation, um, which then led to me um, being nominated for the Essex Police Awards for the Wilson Trophy. So that's the most outstanding act of the year. I was uh, very proud to have that. Yeah, um, I was, was up against a like? challenge. I mean, it was, it was awesome. You went for a nice dinner. Um, there were lots of people there. Uh, my category was very strong and I was shocked when I won. Um, I got a standing ovation for that. So, uh, yeah, what, what more can you say? Absolutely, and it's thoroughly well-deserved. And it does make me think, you know, you're often in high-risk, high-adrenaline situations where members of the public, as well as yourselves, are in immediate danger. What is going through your mind in that point? Or is it only in situations where you're at awards or having conversations that you start to reflect on what has happened and, and really process it? You don't know at the time. At the time, you just do what your training tells you to do. It's natural instinct to do everything that we do there at scenes. Um, it's only now when you go to your awards or you'll get your certificate from the Chief Constable that you look back and you go, you know what, yeah, that was a good thing that I did there. Yeah, does it, does it make you feel proud when you go back to your job and, you know, you've had that kind of congratulation, really, from, from your colleagues? Oh, yeah, it spurs me on to do more. So, yeah, yeah very much so. Yeah, well, you're not stopping, are you? After this, you're straight back to work. Absolutely, like I said in that clip, never a dull day on road policing. That's very, very <laughs> true, Jill. Well, make sure you keep in touch and please stay safe. I will, thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for joining us. Right. Jill, you are super cop. Now, one quick punch can leave a lifetime of problems for the person it's inflicted on, as our next appeal shows so clearly. England's footballers are on the brink of sporting immortality. Take on Italy in tonight's European Championship Following final. Following a string of thrilling matches that have brought joy to millions and united the nation. The excitement that built up for that final was something special and something that we haven't really experienced so much before. It's coming on! On the 11th of July 2021, as football fever gripped the nation, Sean Thurgood and his partner Rebecca headed into London to watch England play in the European Championship final. When we first got off the train, um, you could hear everyone chanting and singing and the mood was really good. Everyone was sort of excited for the game ahead. The atmosphere was, was the reason that brought us into London for it, really. One of our friends, Ryan, lives in London. We all decided to, to find a bar over in Shoreditch to actually watch itself. The mood was very good and spirits were very high. England took the lead really early on. Um, unfortunately, in Italy, go and, go and equalise and it comes down to penalties. The spirits really dampened um, when we started missing the penalties and obviously when we inevitably lost as well. The atmosphere kind of went flat. No one was saying anything. It was just completely silent and you could kind of hear the hum from, from the tellies. We were quite tight for time for getting the last train home um, because of the penalties going on so long. We needed to, to get a brisk walk on and get back to Liverpool Street, back to the kids. Sean, Rebecca and Ryan left the pub around a quarter past 11 and went along Curtain Road towards the station. The streets were absolutely packed, you know, there were people everywhere. We had the phone out for the directions. I'd linked arms with, with both Sean and our friend Ryan. It was just the three of us to try and keep us together. Um, and next thing, as we'd sort of turned, Sean had accidentally sort of bumped into uh, another guy that was walking the opposite way. Just a pure accident, bump of the shoulders. And that's, that's what sort of sparked, sparked his anger, really. We'd carried on walking. We could hear something being shouted at us. So we turned round and, and he was shouting after us. I remember Sean trying to talk to the guy um, and sort of say, sorry, you know, he didn't mean it. And just trying to defuse the situation. It was then that the man approached their friend Ryan and punched him. Then he turned his attention to Sean. I saw him hit the ground. The noise that it made was like a thud. I just remember shouting out, what have you done? 
We've got young children. Sean was laying on, on the ground. He had his eyes wide open, and I thought he was dead. Um, I, I don't think he was breathing at the time. Um, and I was just calling out for help. These two came over and, and they cleared his airways. They got him breathing again. They got him in the recovery position and they called the ambulance. They were amazing, to be honest. When we got to the hospital, they took him down to resus and they said that if you need to call anyone, you should do it now. Um, and they were concerned at that point. We didn't know whether he was going to make it. The thought that I might lose Sean um, and that my kids might grow up without a dad, that what, what do I do now? How do I tell my children? I don't remember anything sort of for, for a period of six hours. So it was quite confusing then waking up in a gown, really, and, and, and with so many injuries and, and, and feeling so, so horrendous as well, my head just pounding. I had a fracture on the right side of my head. I had hearing loss in my right ear as well. And I had sort of multiple bleeds on my brain. One punch um, that's done, done all the damage, really. Ryan managed to get away from, from the attacker eventually as well. He had quite a um, nasty sort of cut and, and sort of bruised lip and, and busted knee and black eye. Sean is doing amazingly well, considering. You do notice that he's a little bit more forgetful. He can be a bit more temperamental as well. So she notices that I can be, be a lot more blunt, really, and, and, and less sensitive and emotional. That is as a result of his brain injury. Um, it's something that we've just got to kind of live with. My kids were very young at the time, so it was, I'm sure it's quite confusing for them whilst not being able to, to do what I usually do with them, you know, being able to do the breakfast routine and, and little things that we take for granted. I found it quite difficult to process what happened um, and what I saw, and I still sometimes have have nightmares, and it still kind of haunts me a little bit. It kind of changes your whole outlook because you can see how quickly something can change. The injuries and the brain injury, in particular, is is permanent. Um, I won't ever get back to how I was before, where people think that it's just, just one punch. Could end up being the kids not seeing them ever again. Whereas for the attacker, he's essentially just walked away and got on with his night and, and got on with his usual life. An unprovoked assault that has had lasting consequences on a young family. Sean was punched to the ground on the 11th of July 2021. It was one of the busiest nights of the year and the streets were packed with football fans, most of who were out for a good night. Sean was making his way home along with his partner Rebecca and their friend Ryan. They approached the corner of Old Street, Hoxton Street and Hoxton Square outside the bar Shoreditch Bulls when Sean accidentally bumped into this man. Now, as you can see, the man immediately reacted to the accidental bump and became aggressive, attacking Sean's friend Ryan first before going on to punch Sean. He eventually just walks off with his friends, leaving Sean unconscious on the floor. Let's have a good look. Do you recognise this man in the CCTV? Did you see him in the area on the night of the Euros final? Remember, that's the 11th of July 2021. The assailant walked away that night while Sean has had to live with the lasting impact of this man's actions. Please do get in touch. If you have any information, our phone lines are open.
Now, each year the RSPB conduct a bird crime survey and last year's data confirmed the, bird, the cases of bird of prey persecutions in England were the second highest on record, but they believe may only be the tip of a far larger iceberg with many incidents going unreported. Well, we're joined now by Jenny Shelton from the RSPB's investigation team to find out more. Thanks so much for coming in, Jenny. This is a real problem, isn't it? So what has the data shown? It is, yeah. So when we talk about raptor persecution, what we mean is the shooting, trapping and poisoning of protected birds of prey. So all birds of prey are protected by law in the UK. However, we are still seeing, unfortunately, birds like buzzards, red kites and even golden eagles being killed. And one species that's been really badly affected is the hen harrier? Yeah, that's right. This is a really rare sort of moorland dwelling species. Um, most people probably won't have seen one before and um, they live in these upland habitats. Um, and unfortunately, um, what we know from our, from our data is that um, they are b becoming, they, their numbers are so low because of illegal persecution. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a real shame, isn't it? So how are the RSPB and, and police forces tackling the crimes? What are they doing? So we have a dedicated um, investigations unit and we work with police to gather evidence and carry out surveillance work in order to investigate these crimes. And what we know from our bird crime report is that 71% of these incidents were taking place in 2021 on uh, game bird estates. So this is where land is managed um, heavily to produce the largest amount of red grouse or partridge or pheasant in order to be shot. And this is where the conflict with the birds of prey arises. Um, so we carry out surveillance work, observation work, and then we also take reports from the public who may have noticed a bird crime and reported it to us. Yeah, and of course it's important to mention it's not all gamekeepers, is it? But it's, it's sad to hear that this is something that is going on. Mm. Um, you have had some notable successes though, haven't you? Yes, we have, yeah. Um, a few years back, actually, we managed to catch someone actually in the act of shooting two short-eared owls. So this is a gamekeeper on a grouse moor in Cumbria. And um, my colleagues were out filming and they, they observed this and they saw him then try and hide the bodies. Uh, they, they filmed it, they called the police who arrived and arrested him there and then. There was also another really graphic incident where a buzzard was caught in a cage trap. And so we installed a remote camera to see what was going on. And uh, what we actually found in the footage when we reviewed that was a man coming along, entering the trap and then killing this buzzard. And he received a suspended jail sentence and a fine. Some of this footage is, is, is shocking, isn't it? Yeah. The, the crimes are, are really brutal. Now, it's obvious why we should be reporting these crimes, but they do pose a risk to members of the public as well, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had incidents where dogs have po been poisoned by um, baits that have been left out in the countryside um, intended for birds of prey. So there is a real risk to public health here. Mm. Um, so if anybody does notice anything, um, please get in touch. And of course, you know, we're in the middle of a nature crisis here. You know, UK wildlife is under increasing pressures and disappearing at an alarming rate. So there's just really no place in this day and age for the illegal killing of wildlife. You mentioned that if people do spot this type of crime that they should get in touch. What's, what's the best route? What should they do? Well, the first thing to do is to call the police on 101. Um, also report it to ourselves. The RSPB has an online reporting form. So if you just go and search for report a bird crime, you'll find that form and just fill it out with as much information as you can. Yeah, it's, it's so important as well. And I think just overall, education is, is key, isn't it? Everybody wants to protect the wildlife and, and make sure that these crimes aren't happening. But more conversations need to be had, don't they? Exactly. Yeah, quite right. Um, well, Jenny, thank you so much for coming in today. Really appreciate all the information. Raph. Now, we're hearing from a woman's rights advocate who's used her life experiences to empower victims of domestic violence and who believes everyone should give jiu-jitsu a try. I hate gender stereotypes. We can be bold, we can be strong. That was makes a woman the complex goddess that she is. I'm Paola Diana, I'm a podcast host, I'm a mother, and I'm also a women's rights campaigner. I was born in Italy, in Padua, near Venice. It was quite challenging, my childhood, because I come from a very conservative uh, family, and it was quite misogynistic. My father was, in my opinion, a tyrant. 
I was terrified constantly when I was at home and I decided I didn't want to be in that situation anymore. But also I was robbed uh, 20 years ago uh, in Italy and I felt powerless and I didn't want to feel powerless anymore. I decided to train in martial arts because I wanted to feel stronger. And I considered Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu a very good uh, self-defense training. After I got my blue belt, I decided after just one month to compete at the Europeans. It was considered like a crazy move. And then unexpectedly, I actually won and I became European champion. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is called the chess of the body because you have to use your brain in order to be smarter than your opponent. One grip, two grip on the outside. And you could overcome your aggressor. Sometimes you can't even breathe very well, but you have to keep calm and find the way out to give to the smaller opponent uh, the right techniques in order to overcome a bigger opponent. And that's why I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is very good for girls and women. And I truly suggest uh, every girl uh, and every woman to give it a go. I think I overcome my uh, difficulties in my life and I'm grateful for that every day and that's why I think uh, it's good for me to try to inspire other girls and women because I think we should feel limitless. We have to feel powerful. I always say that we are goddesses, we just forgot about that. What an inspirational woman. I might give uh, Jiu-Jitsu a try. Now, this week, it's the fifth anniversary of a double murder in Coventry, and West Midlands police are reappealing for information. The victims are 33-year-old Johnny Robbins, who disappeared on the 21st of March 2018. Now, police believe he was kidnapped, tortured and then murdered but his body has never been found. Police believe his death is linked to a second murder of Daniel Shaw, who was found with gunshot injuries to his chest in Cope Copland Place in the Tile Hill area of Coventry. That was just a few days later on the 25th of March, 2018. Now they've released this picture of an Audi SQ5, which they believe was used to transport Johnny after he was kidnapped. It was found in Birmingham 18 months later and has been forensically examined as part of the investigation. Police are also asking for the public's help to trace this man in a motorcycle helmet and trace the van. These images were captured on CCTV outside Daniel Shaw's address before the shooting. And today, a £20,000 Crime Stoppers reward has been launched for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of those responsible. So if you do have any information at all, please get in touch. Now, let's take a look at today's Wanted Faces. <clears throat> And first today, we've got 29-year-old Grant Westlake. Although, <clears throat> excuse me, he goes by the name Ashley and sometimes uses the surname of Higgs. He's been charged with serious driving offences and also criminal damage. He has a slim build with cropped brown hair and brown eyes and is known to have links to Lewisham and West Norwood, both of which are in London. Or maybe you've seen this guy, this is Lee Field. He's been charged with possession of Class A drugs with intent to supply, but he's failed to turn up to his trial and is now wanted by police in Cumbria. The 39-year-old has a southern English accent, is of a slim build and has a piercing in his left ear. He has connections across Cumbria and also London. Next, this here is Keith Burns. He also calls himself Anthony or Colin and sometimes uses the surname Griffiths. Avon and Somerset Police have charged him with assault. However, he failed to turn up to court and is now a warrant out for his arrest. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally for today, do you know this man, Sharam Kali Ahmed, although he also uses the name Sean. Ahmed appeared in court in 2021 in relation to serious offences and was released on bail, but he never turned up for his trial. He was convicted in his absence and was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. He's 36 and has a Kurdish accent with tattoos on both of his arms and his left hand. He has contacts in Durham and also Cardiff. Please do get in touch if you know the whereabouts of any of these faces. The numbers of how to do that are on your screen. 
Just time now for a quick update on this morning's appeals. So earlier today, we heard about the assault on Sean Thurgood, who was punched by a stranger, leaving him with life-changing injuries. Now, this image is of the man who threw the punch. So if you do recognise him, please do get in touch with us. And we also heard about the murder of 21-year-old Takeo Nembard. Takeo was fatally stabbed at Notting Hill Carnival in August 2022. We're back with Detective Inspector Laura Semple. Um, can we just start by recapping on exactly what happened that day? So Takeo um, attended the carnival with some friends. He'd been walking um, along sort of Labrook Grove towards Westway area, where he sort of briefly became separated from his friends um, and he was fatally stabbed sort of underneath the Westway area. Um, he was stabbed in the groin area. Um, it was one single stab wound which uh, hit his femoral artery, uh, where he collapsed and later died. Yeah, this is a, a really tragic attack, isn't it? Just remind us of um, a particular individual that you want to identify. So we're um, appealing for any help to identify this individual. He's got a really distinctive cap on um, with Yankees. Uh, he's a black male. Um, any help that we can get to identify him would really help our investigation. And as you said, this is Notting Hill Carnival. It's a day where so many people go from, from all over the UK to attend. You're hoping that someone has seen something or indeed recognised Takeo because he was quite quite distinctive. He was very tall, wasn't he? Yeah, so Takeo was six foot eight, um, so very tall. Um, and anyone that saw anything, um, if they saw the group run away, they saw the incident itself, please, please get in contact. Any help could be valuable to the investigation. And if you're scared, then um, there are measures we can put in place. Please just come forward. Yeah, we heard from Takeo's parents, Sandra and Vincent, and they echoed exactly what you said there, Laura. If anybody is scared to come forward, they'd urge them to do so. There are things that you can put in place. They are absolutely hope heartbroken. They just want some answers and, and get Takeo there some of the justice that he deserves. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for coming thank in you. today. If you can help with this case, then please do get in touch. Thanks for watching. We're back at 10 o'clock tomorrow for our last show with an exclusive look at how an undercover operation caught a serial sex offender. The victims, when they came to us, were extremely traumatised. And if we didn't act quickly, I was absolutely certain we would have had a more serious offence occur in that area. And remember, if you are affected by any of the issues in today's show, you can find details of organisations which offer advice and support at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. And for more details about the crimes featured on today's programme to watch some of the series so far, you can head to iPlayer, where we'll be available for the next seven days. We're going to leave you with another look at this morning's Wanted Faces now, though. If you've seen them, call us and tell us where they are. We'll see you tomorrow for the last show. Bye-bye.